Father in heaven, it's with reverence that we come into your presence to study your holy book, the Bible. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we work through its pages. I ask, Lord, that you will give us clear minds, open hearts, remove any obstacle that would keep us from hearing your voice. We thank you for the promise of your presence and we claim that promise in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. In a previous lecture we studied how the Romans came with their legions to the city of Jerusalem, put their standards in the ground, and worshiped the standards as a sign that the city was soon to fall. We notice that the standard contained an eagle with outstretched wings and a golden wreath around it representing the sun god Mithra. So the Roman legions were asked, actually worshiping the sun god Mithra as they kneeled before their standards. Then we also studied another lesson on how the United States of America, the nation represented by an eagle in the end time, is going to enact a national Sunday law. You see, the great seal of the United States not only contains an eagle with outstretched wings, but it also contains two sunbursts on either side of the seal. So the United States will enact a national Sunday law commanding everyone to worship on the day of the sun. Though the prospect of a national Sunday law appears impossible today, we already notice that events at the end of the 19th century show that it is very possible for this to happen in these United States of America in spite of the fact that the First Amendment to the Constitution tells us that Congress can make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now in this study we're going to look at a blueprint of end time events from the perspective of someone who wrote over 130 years ago. Ellen White, whom the Seventh-day Adventist Church considers a prophet for these times, wrote the book The Great Controversy. This is the illustrated edition. You can get it from Secrets Unsealed. It's beautiful. It has color pictures. It has large print. We also have a simpler copy. But I would recommend that you get a copy of this book from Secrets Unsealed because it is the best commentary that we can find on Matthew chapter 24 and end time events from a prophetic perspective. So I would encourage you to get a copy of this very important book. In the future we're going to notice that during the decades of the 80s and 90s, a movement or several movements arose in the United States using the same basic arguments that were used at the end of the 19th century, which shows that in more contemporary times you could have a religious movement wanting what was wanted by the religious leaders back in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s. And then we're also going to have two presentations on what is happening now in our time, in the year 2020. So we still have a lot of material to study in this series. So now we're going to take a look at Ellen White's perspective of end time events, her blueprint of end time events. And the first thing that we're going to do is provide an outline of the main points that Ellen White brings to view when she speaks about end time prophecy. What is going to happen with the papacy and the United States in the end time? So I'm going to give an outline and then I'm going to read many statements from Ellen White where she speaks about what is going to take place. We're going to amplify the main points that we're going to just look at in outline form. The first point that Ellen White brings to view in her blueprint of end time events is that the United States of America will embrace Roman Catholic principles by uniting church and state. You see the word papacy does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy means the union of church and state, a system that unites church and state. 
The deadly wound does not mean that the Catholic Church disappeared. What it means is that the papacy lost its ability to use the civil powers of the world to accomplish its purpose. So now we are living in the pause between what the papacy did in the past and what the papacy will do in the future. And Ellen White underlines that the United States, according to the prophecy of Revelation 13, 11 to 18, is going to provide an image of the papacy by uniting church and state, the principles upon which the papacy is built. The next point is that the Protestant churches in the United States will unite on common points of doctrine. They will set aside their doctrinal differences where they have discrepancies and they will unite on what they have in common. Next, the populace instigated by their ministers, in other words the church members instigated by their ministers will blame the social and natural upheavals to those who are keeping God's holy seventh day Sabbath day of rest. In other words the wars and rumors of wars, the pestilence, the famine, the earthquakes are all going to be blamed on God's people just as in the days of Elijah, Elijah was blamed by Ahab, just like Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome. Ellen White also mentions that the legislators of this country, in order to gain the favor of the people, will support the Sunday law because of the pressure that is put upon them. Revelation chapter 13 describes this as the beast from the earth speaking. The, earth, the beast from the earth will speak like a dragon and a nation speaks through its laws, through its legislative powers. Politicians will fear losing the support of their constituents and therefore they will go along with a national Sunday law. Now the political leaders of the Sunday movement in 1888 did not have any idea where this was really leading. Likewise, at the end of time, we find that the political leaders are not going to be aware of the motivations of the religious leaders that are attempting to use them to accomplish their purposes. I'm reminded of the story of King Ahasuerus in the days of Queen Esther. You know, he had a religious advisor, Haman, who said, you need to destroy all of the Jews because their laws are different than any other people's laws. And it's risky to keep anybody around who has different laws. And so he suggested to the king to give a law to exterminate all of the Jews, to commit genocide. And the king went along. He didn't realize what the agenda was. The same is going to happen with the political leaders at the end. They're not going to realize what the agenda of the religious leaders is. And of course, when uh, the king, when King Ahasuerus realized the real motivations of Haman, the Bible tells us that the king arose against Haman and he hung on the gallows that were supposed to be for Mordecai. At the end of time, prophecy tells us in Revelation chapter 17 that the kings, when they wake up to the true agenda of the religious leaders, they will turn on the religious leaders of the nation because they have been deceived into enacting a national Sunday law and they didn't realize what the motivations of the religious leaders were. The next point is that the religious leaders will press for an amendment to the Constitution of the United States. What is clearly unconstitutional will de be declared by the Supreme Court as constitutional. Protestants, she continues, will unite with Roman Catholics to lobby for the National Sunday Law. In fact, Catholics will not only lobby for a National Sunday Law, Protestants will encourage Catholics to help them enact a National Sunday Law. The beast from the earth will make an image of the first beast in honor of the first beast which represents the papacy. The next point is 
that Sunday laws will eventually become anti-Sabbath laws. In other words, not only will Sunday be imposed by law as the day of worship, but people will be forbidden from keeping the Sabbath. Now obviously, both of those would be unconstitutional, and they would be, would be an infringement of the first two clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The first clause of the First Amendment tells us that Congress can make no law for the establishment of religion. And the second uh, phrase tells us that it cannot also curtail the freedom to worship according to the dictates of conscience. It cannot establish religion nor forbid the free exercise of religion. So a National Sunday Law and an anti-Sabbath law would clearly be unconstitutional because establishing a National Sunday Law is establishing religion and forbidding Sabbath observance would be forbidding the free exercise thereof. Whenever these two clauses are violated, the automatic result is persecution, as you can see from Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. In Daniel chapter 3, you find King Nebuchadnezzar, the civil ruler, building a gigantic image and commanding everyone to worship. The king is establishing religion. What was the result? The three young men ended up in the fiery furnace, and if God had not come to deliver them, they would have burnt up. But in Daniel chapter 6 you have another story that illustrates the second phrase of the, con the First Amendment to the Constitution, and that is that in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is forbidden from praying to his God. See, that's not an establishment of religion, that's a prohibition against him practicing his religion. And what was the result? The result is that Daniel ended up in the lion's den, but God once again came and protected Daniel. Ellen White continues her blueprint of end time events. She stated that the clergy will use underhanded and devious methods to secure Sunday law legislation. They will not overtly show what the true agenda behind it is. Ellen White also mentions that the advocates of Sunday laws will link it with many good causes. You know, back in 1888, uh, it was prohibition that was linked with the Sunday Law. The WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and the third party prohibitionists fought for a Sunday Law tooth and nail, but they also fought for temperance. Now perhaps the issues will be family, climate change, gender issues, marriage between a man and a woman, and the sanctity of life. In other words, there might be different issues, but still, the point is that Sunday legislation will be linked with other causes that are not necessarily bad. Ellen White continues saying that eventually the entire world will follow in the footsteps of the United States and eventually enforce a universal Sunday law. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 tells us that when the deadly wound is healed, the entire world wondered after the beast. Some people say, Pastor Bohr, you're crazy. How are, are the Muslims going to keep Sunday? How are the Hindus and the Buddhists going to keep Sunday as the day of rest? Listen folks, when things get really bad, when there's terrible riots and turmoil in society, when there are many natural disasters, one right after another, of different types, and when there are miraculous things that are happening in the world, strange things can happen. In other words, this will be for global survival. And the Bible tells us that the beast and the false prophet are going to perform signs and wonders. So people are going to say, these signs and wonders are evidence that God is with this movement. So the natural disasters and social disasters and the miracles that are taking place will lead people to believe that God is on the side of the entire world in enacting a Sunday law. Ellen White further states that God's people who refuse to keep the Sunday law 
and insist on keeping the Sabbath will lose their civil rights and suffer persecution. Eventually they will not be able to buy or sell and finally they will be sentenced to death. You say, Pastor Bohr, that is impossible in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well folks, prophecy tells us that this is going to happen. And we can know that prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Jesus says, I have told you these things beforehand so that when they occur, occur you might believe. So those of you who are thinking that this is preposterous, that this could never happen, I want you to remember what we're studying today and when you see it happening, remember, oh, I heard this in the series on Matthew chapter 24 and it's happening right before my eyes. I better make sure I'm on the right side of this issue. So now let's unpack what Ellen White had to say by reading several statements from her writings. You know, uh, it's, it's not a lot of fun to simply read statements, but I could explain it, but she wrote in a way in which she can explain it much better than I can. So I'm going to take the time to read several statements from Ellen White, sustaining the bullet points that we've discussed so far in our study. First of all, what Ellen White speaks about regarding the union of church and state in the United States of America. In Great Controversy, page 442, Ellen White wrote regarding a National Sunday Law, such an action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. The founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the church, with its inevitable result, intolerance and persecution. The Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office of public trust under the United States. And then she comments this, only in flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority but the inconsistency of such action is no, no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns, in profession pure, gentle, and harmless, that speaks as a dragon. A few years ago I wrote a book called Prophecies, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where I uh, unpacked this prophecy of Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18 where you have this beast that has two horns like a lamb representing the United States. You know, what is more inoffensive and peaceful as a lamb? And yet it speaks like a dragon. This shows what's going to happen in the United States. It's going to profess to be in harmony with its constitution. It's not going to get rid of the First Amendment to the constitution, but by making Sunday laws and enforcing Sunday laws, it is going to contradict the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. It will profess one thing, but in its actions it will do something different. In Great Controversy, page 581, Ellen White wrote, Let the principle once be established in the United States, that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. And when she speaks of Rome here, she's speaking about papal Rome. So she says, join church and state in the United States and the victory of Rome is absolutely assured in these United States of America because the main characteristic of the papacy, the meaning of the word papacy is the union of church and state using the church to influence the state to implement the church's agenda. 
Notice Great Controversy, page 615. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities, listen carefully, have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. And I know you're thinking, Pastor Boer, this is the United States. This can never happen in the United States. Never say never. In another statement, in the book Evangelism, page 235, another book written by Ellen White, we find these words. When Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion, for opposing which their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy, that's what we might call the abomination, which will end only in national ruin, that is desolation. Once again, in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 712, Ellen White wrote concerning the National Reform Movement, which was the movement in the latter half of the 19th century, the following, the National Reform Movement, exercising the power of religious legislation, will, when fully developed, manifest the same intolerance and oppression that have prevailed in past ages. Human councils then assumed the prerogatives of deity, crushing under their despotic power liberty of conscience, and imprisonment, exile, and death followed for those who opposed their dictates. If pop popery, popery means the papacy, it's a word that was used back in the 19th century, if popery or its principles shall again be legislated into power, the fires of persecution will be rekindled against those who will not sacrifice conscience and the truth in deference to popular errors. This evil is on the point of realization. Ellen White also wrote that the political leaders will be oblivious to the real agenda and the results of Sunday legislation. They will think that Sunday legislation is a great idea because we will return to God. People will go back to church. And in this way, the calamities in nature and the calamities in society will be turned aside and God will bless His people again. But the opposite is going to happen because this is a return to church by obligation and it is contrary to what God teaches in His Holy Word. If they said everybody should observe the Sabbath, not by law, but voluntarily, that would be fine. But telling people that they have to violate God's holy law and keep a day that the fourth commandment does not tell us to keep is apostasy, and they don't see the results. In Five Testimonies, page 711, Ellen White wrote, There are many... Even those engaged in this movement for Sunday enforcement who are blinded to the results which will follow this action, they do not see that they are striking directly against religious liberty. In the Review and Herald, January 1, 1889, Ellen White spoke about what was behind these laws. She wrote, There is a sat satanic force propelling the Sunday movement, but it is concealed. In other words, it looks good, but it's not. She continues, even the men who are engaged in this work, see, even those who were pressuring for a Sunday law, even the men who are engaged in the work are themselves blinded to the results which will follow their movement. In other words, it will lead to national ruin because it's an abomination in the sight of God. Ezekiel chapter 8 tells us the greatest abomination that was being committed among those who professed to serve God was that the leaders had their backs to the temple of God and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. That was the greatest abomination. 
and it will be the greatest abomination at the end of time, changing God's holy law by human legislation. In volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 452, Ellen White wrote, The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is, is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. Ellen White also, as we noticed when we studied the bullet points, told us that Protestants will stretch their hand to grasp the hand of the Roman Catholic Papacy. In the book Maranatha, page 179, Ellen White wrote, Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act. What is a national act? It's an act of Congress, folks. By a national act, she says, uh, enforcing the false Sabbath, they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience. You know, notice the words give life, give vigor, revive again. You can't revive something that hasn't died. The papacy received a deadly wound. But we're told here that Protestants will help the papacy revive. They will help the wound resurrect. Uh, the papacy resurrect from the wound. Great Controversy, page 566. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made com compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. We're going to have a couple of lectures where we're going to talk about what's happening with Protestantism and Catholicism today. She continues, Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. Ellen White states that the papacy will not take the initiative in the Sunday Law, Protestants will, and then they will request the aid of the papacy. In this rather long statement from a collection of Ellen White's writings called Spalding McGann, pages 1 and 2, Ellen White wrote the following, I saw that the two-horned beast, that is the beast that rises from the earth, had a dragon's mouth, and that his power was in his head, and that the decree would go out of his mouth. Remember, a nation speaks through its legislative powers, so the mouth of this beast is the legislator of the nation represented. She continues, Then I saw the mother of harlots, that's a papacy, that the mother was not the daughters. See, the mother is the papacy, the daughters are the Protestant denominations. So, then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from her. She has had her day, and it is past. This is the 1260 years that she's talking about. And her daughters, this is Protestantism, and her daughter, daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage. That's Revelation 13, 11 to 18. Revelation 13, the first half of the chapter, deals with the papacy during the 1260 years. The second half of the chapter deals with what Protestants will do to restore power to the papacy again. So once again, she has had her day and it is past. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out, listen carefully, act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. In other words, she'll make an image of the first beast. I saw that as the mother has been declining in power, the daughters had been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. In other words, they will do it to support the mother. She continues, I saw the nominal, nominal church and nominal Adventists like Judas would betray us Seventh-day Adventists to the Catholics to obtain their influence, that is the influence of the Catholics to come against the truth. The saints will then be an obscure people, little known to the Catholics. 
but the churches and nominal Adventists who know of our faith and customs will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics as those who disregard the institutions of the people, that is, that, that they keep Sabbath and disregard Sunday. Then, she states, the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward. So the Protestants first ask the papacy for help, then the papacy says, go for it. Then the Catholics bid the Protestant to go forward and issue a decree that all who will not observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh day shall be slain. And the Catholics, whose numbers are large, will stand by the Protestants. The Catholics will give their power to the image of the beast, and the Protestants will work as their mother worked before them to destroy the saints. But before their decree brings bring or bear fruit, the saints will be delivered, delivered by the voice of God. You say, Pastor, that is an amazing statement. That's never going to happen. Never say never, folks. In volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 711 and 712, Ellen White wrote, Any movement in favor of religious legislation is really an act of concession to the papacy which for so many ages has steadily warred against the liberty of conscience. Sunday observance owes its existence as a so-called Christian institution to the mystery of iniquity, and its enforcement will be a virtual recognition of the principles which are the very cornerstone of Romanism, that is the union of church and state. Then she states, when our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. It will be nothing else than giving life to the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again into active despotism. Did you notice the terminology she uses? She says, it will be nothing else than giving life, that's because the papacy has a deadly wound, giving life to the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again, because the papacy ruled in the past, to spring again into active despotism. So the papacy is inactive. Now we are in the pause period between the two phases of the tribulation, the past phase, 538 to 1798, and the future phase, which is right before the close of probation. Ellen White also states that there will be among Protestants a desire to unite with Catholics on the basis of doctrines that they hold in common, as well as united denom uniting denominations among the Protestants, uniting on common points of doctrine and setting aside the issues on which they don't agree. In the book Great Controversy, page 445, Ellen White wrote, when the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrines as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed, formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably, inevitably result. So they're going to unite on common points of doctrine, and then they're going to influence the state to do what the church wants, which is a national Sunday law. In Great Controversy, page 444, Ellen White wrote, the wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. But there has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. So they're going to waive the issues that divide Protestants and they're going to unite on common doctrines, and two of those doctrines will be the sanctity of Sunday and the immortality of the soul, 
which Catholics and Protestants, virtually all Protestants, share in common. In another statement, Great Controversy, page 563, we find these words, There is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed, and that a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. Ellen White also wrote about the role of the clergy in securing a National Sunday Law. In Review and Herald, December 24, 1889, Ellen White wrote these powerful words, Plans of serious import to the people of God are advancing in an underhand manner among the clergymen of various denominations, and the object of this secret maneuvering is to win popular favor for the enforcement of Sunday sacredness. So notice, secret maneuvering to win popular favor for the enforcement of Sunday sacredness. Now listen carefully. If the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, then the clergy intend to exert their united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. This reminds us of the times of Christ. You know, it was not the populace that came up with the idea of crucifying Christ. It was actually the religious leaders of that day and age that instigated the people to clamor for the death of Jesus. People need to learn to think for themselves, folks. Don't just believe everything that you hear. Compare what you hear with what God says in His Holy Word. Ellen White also states that politicians will accede to the popular demand. In other words, they'll give in to the popular demand. Many of them might not believe that it's a good idea. Many might believe that it's unconstitutional and yet they will go along with the Sunday law that the religious leaders want. In Great Controversy, page 592, Ellen White gave us the reason why. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, listen carefully now, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, we call them votes, folks, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In another statement that we find in the book Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 475, Ellen White wrote, We cannot labor to please men who will use their influence to repress religious liberty and to set in operation oppressive measures to lead or compel their fellow men to keep Sunday as the Sabbath. The first day of the week is not a day to be reverenced. It is a spurious Sabbath, and the members of the Lord's family cannot participate with the men who exalt this day and violate the law of God by trampling upon His Sabbath. The people of God are not to vote to place such men in office, for when they do this, that is, those who vote, they are partakers with them of the sins which they commit while in office. You know, also Ellen White discussed the issue of introducing religious, religious um, curriculum into public schools. Now I want you to remember all these details because when I uh, present the lecture on the events that took place in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s, you're going to find a movement in relative recent times that we're clamoring for the same that we're talking about now. So you say, well, this is pie in the sky. This is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It happened in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and it is happening today as we see in a future lecture. Ellen White wrote in The Watchman, May 1, 1906, 
the present effort of the, of the church, the present effort of the church to get the state to introduce the teaching of Christianity into state schools is but a revival of the doctrine of force in religious things, and as such it is anti-Christian. Wow! Ellen White also wrote in letter 44, 1893, you see people say, well you know, God was kicked out of public school when, uh, when students were told that they couldn't actually uh, bring the Bible to, to school. That's not true. The school cannot legislate the reading of the Bible because that would be unconstitutional, but students are free to come to school with their Bible. They can even form voluntarily study groups to study the Bible. They can get groups of students together to pray as long as it's not mandated, mandated by the government. Ellen White wrote about introducing the Bible into, to be read in public schools. This is a by official decree of the government. Letter 44, 1893. I do not see the justice nor right in enforcing by law the bringing of the Bible to be read in the public schools. And I bring this to view because this is what was being pushed for in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. Ellen White also mentioned that good causes will be linked with the idea of a national Sunday law. In Great Controversy 587 and 588, Ellen White wrote, Here the temperance work, one of the most prominent and important of moral reforms, is often combined with the Sunday movement. She's talking about what happened in 1888. And the advocates of the latter represent themselves as laboring to promote the highest interest of society. And those who refuse to unite with them are denounced as enemies of temperance and reform. In other words, if you don't join uh, the Sunday movement, they say, oh, then you're in, uh, in favor of uh, liquor. They were saying back then. Now in this time, you know, if you don't uh, uh, keep Sunday as the day of rest, if you're not in harmony with the Sunday legislation, well, they say, oh, this person is against the family. This against, uh, person is against the idea of climate change. This person is, uh, is against this and against that. They're going to link good causes with a bad cause, which is a national Sunday law. She continues writing, however, the fact that a movement to establish error is connected with a work which, which is in itself good is not an argument in favor of the error. We may disguise poison, now she uses an illustration, we may disguise poison by mingling it with wholesome food, but we do not change its nature. On the contrary, it is rendered more dangerous as it is more likely to be taken unawares. It is one of Satan's devices, devices to combine with falsehood just enough truth to give it plausibility. The leaders of the Sunday movement may advocate reforms which the people need, principles which are in harmony with the Bible, yet while there is with these a requirement which is contrary to God's law, His servants cannot unite with them. Nothing can justify them in setting aside the commandments of God for the precepts of men. Another point that Ellen White mentions is that God's people will be blamed for what's ha happening in the world, for the turmoil, the natural disasters, etc. Great Controversy, page 592. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Why? Because they're not going along with the Sunday law. But you must obey God rather than man, even when it comes to civil legislation. You must be in harmony with your own conscience. She continues uh, the, uh, the, this statement in the following way. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, 
commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. Ellen White also mentioned that the Constitution will be amended. Regarding the crisis as it existed in her day, in the 1880s, she wrote in Five Testimonies 711, A great crisis awaits the people of God. A crisis awaits the world. The most momentous struggle of all the ages is just before us. Events which for more than 40 years we have, upon the authority of the prophetic word, declared to be impending, are now taking place before our eyes. She's talking about what was taking place in 1888. She had been saying that there was going to be a National Sunday Law. Well, it didn't happen, and she realized that it didn't, but that doesn't mean that the idea has died. She continues, Already, the question, speaking about the 1880s, already the question of an amendment to the Constitution restricting liberty of conscience has been urged upon the legislators of the nation. The question of enforcing Sunday observance has become one of national interest and importance, which was true at that particular time. In Review and Herald, December 11, 1888, Ellen White wrote, They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation, and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. You say, well, she's speaking hyperbolic, uh, it's in hyperbole. Bringing legislation into the Constitution will take us to the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages? Yes, you just wait and see. In Five Testimonies, page 713, Ellen White realized that this movement at that particular moment might not be the final one. She wrote, It may be that a respite may yet be granted for God's people to awake and let their light shine. If the presence of ten righteous persons would have saved the wicked cities of the plain, is it not possible that God will yet, in answer to the prayers of His people, hold in check the workings of those who are making void His law? Shall we not humble our hearts greatly before God, flee to the mercy seat, and plead with Him to reveal His almighty power? So Ellen White realized that in the 1880s, the National Sunday Law might not happen, but she said it will sooner or later. In Review and Held, February 16, 1905, Ellen White wrote, Sooner or later, Sunday laws will be passed. So soon, sooner or later, there's going to be Sunday laws. However, there is much for God's servants to do to warn the people. This work has been greatly retarded by their having to wait and stand against the devisings of Satan, which have been striving to find a place in our work. We are years behind, Ellen White wrote. Ellen White also stated that not only will pro-Sunday laws be established, but also anti-Sabbath laws. In the little work, the Southern work, page 69, Ellen White wrote, wrote, The time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on Sabbath, and men will be asked to renounce the Sabbath and to subscribe to Sunday observance, or forfeit their freedom and their lives. But this time, for the time, for this has not yet come, for the truth must be presented more fully before the people as a witness. And then she states that the whole world will join the United States in the idea of a universal Sunday law. I'm going to read several statements now quickly. Maranatha, page 217. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. It is the purpose of Satan to cause them, that is the remnant, to be blotted from the earth in order that his supremacy of the world may not be disputed. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 18. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, that is Sunday, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Folks, 
every country on the globe will follow the example of the United States. Volume 3 of uh, Selective Messages, page 392, Ellen White wrote, The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved because there will be a global emergency, not a national emergency merely, but a global emergency because of all of the things that are taking place. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 395, Ellen White wrote, Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, see the United States is going to lead out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. One other statement, this is found in the same three selected messages, 427 and 428. The wicked declared that they had the truth, that miracles were among them, that angels from heaven talked with them and walked with them, that great power and signs and wonders were performed among them. So you're going to see a lot of signs and wonders in the Christian world. She says, and that this was the temporal millennium that they had been expecting so long. The whole world was converted and in harmony with the Sunday law. So what is to be the Seventh-day Adventist response to all of this? Ellen White gave counsel to the ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because I hear very little being said about this in this time of crisis in the world. This is present truth. We're seeing events that could very well lead quickly to what we're discussing here from the writings of Ellen White. Ellen White wrote, in five testimonies, page 715, not all our ministers who are giving the third angel's message really understand what constitutes that message. The national reform movement has been regarded by some as of so little importance that they have not thought it necessary to give much attention to it and have even felt that in so doing they would be giving time to questions distinct from the third angel's message. May the Lord forgive our brethren for thus interpreting the very message for this time. The people need to be aroused in regard to the dangers of the present time. The watchmen are asleep. We are years behind. So let me ask you, what is it that um, could actually bring a change to society? Is it more laws? More police? More surveillance? that would lead to peace and harmony in society? Why is it wrong for church and state to be joined together? I want to end by reading a rather lengthy statement from the book Desire of Ages 509 and 510. Powerful statement. Ellen White wrote, But today in the religious world there are multitudes who, as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. They desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in its courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule through, Jesus to rule through legal enactments enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead to execute the laws of his kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had He been willing to establish a temporal dominion to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God and to make them the expositors of His will and the agents of His authority. However, He, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. He would not accept the earthly throne. And then comes this very important section of this statement. The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Did you ever see Jesus picketing or demonstrating or rioting to get society to change? No. So what was the solution? Ellen White continues, Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, 
nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from earthly governments. So Jesus didn't care, right? Of course he cared, but he knew the solution was not in legal enactments. She continues, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. You know, there's this big debate now about, about race in the United States, racism. You know, you can, cannot make someone who is a racist not a racist by legislation. Yeah, you can make laws so that externally society can function better, nothing wrong with that, but really you cannot change a person's heart from being racist to not being racist by laws. The heart has to be changed. Ellen White continues, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie merely in human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. And then comes this, not by the decisions of courts or councils or legislative assemblies, not by the patronage of worldly great men is the kingdom of Christ established, but by the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then she states, Here is the only power that can work the uplifting of mankind and the human agency for the accomplishment of this work is the teaching and practicing of the Word of God. People are not changed by what happens on Capitol Hill, but rather by what happens in the home, in the school, and in the church. Legislation does not change the heart. It might improve society externally so that there's more peace and tranquility, but legislation does not change the heart. The Holy Spirit changes the heart. When the early church lost the spirit and power of God, society fell apart. And that's when the church became apostate and said, let's appeal to the strong arm of the state to bring order in society. And when church and state joined together, the automatic result was persecution against dissenters. So this is only one presentation in many that we will have in the next several lectures on what is happening and what will soon take place.